silence your phones so that we don't have any phone ringing. Uh, I'm Rabbi Micah Hyman. I'm associate rabbi here. I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of Israel Matters Committee. Uh, Rick, thank you. Rick Anton, Michelle Alkin, who will be speaking in a moment, and David Suisa, uh, thank you for being here. Um, it's been quite a week. Yeah? We, yes. So let's take a moment. On Friday, we were here on Friday praying for the poor 11 souls and even those, uh, Daniel Ben Rachel, who continues to heal after uh, the shooting in Tree of Life in Pittsburgh. Uh, our hearts were ripped open. In these last few days, we know the fires have impacted many. Many have been heroic in their uh, ability to help and to save. We have staff members with family, personally, people who have lost their homes. And uh, it's been uh, just really hard to stay focused and to truly stay present to the needs of ourselves and community. So what a privilege then to take a very cool issue like Israel, to take our attention away from uh, the local matters and to say from the fires there to uh, such an important issue. Uh, and I do want to pray. Uh, I want to pray for those souls as we do and pray for those that uh, are healing from uh, loss and to really not just pray with words because that can be very empty, but there is response. Uh, and just in the Jewish Journal uh, this week, uh, we saw one of our responses. Thank God for this community and its strength. But I also want to pray for Medinat Yisrael. Barech et Medinat Yisrael, Reshit Smichat Gu'ulatenu. We pray for the strength of Israel, the beginning of the opening of our ultimate uh, reason uh, to survive and exist and be. Um, believe it or not, that prayer for the state of Israel was written with uh, Yitzchak Halevi Herzog, uh, Bougie Herzog's grandfather, who was the first rabbi of Israel, along with Agnon, who is a great uh, writer. And um, I have here the reason it was co-written. One was edited, and one was written and Agnon edited, because this is what Herzog said to Agnon. People from various communities in the diaspora, and he meant the Americans, are asking me to amend the prayer, to say that this is not a direct redemption, but it is the opening, Rashid. It's the beginning of something that can be better, can be greater. And that is something we all pray for, for its safety, for its security, but also for its ultimate flourishing. And I'm thrilled. Uh, David Suisa, Rick Enton, and Michelle Elkin, everybody from the IM Committee, Israel Matters, it truly is a privilege to be here this evening. So without further ado, I give it to Michelle Elkin. Uh, I'm thrilled uh, to be able to introduce you, and thank you all for being here. Stephen Lewis, how do I do this without a podium and no <laughs> cards? That was a joke. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll wing it. Okay, so welcome, everybody. We're thrilled that you're here tonight. All, I look around, I see all of my favorite people in the room. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michelle Alkin. I am Kehillat Israel board member as well as a co-chair of the Israel Matters Committee. I want to thank the KI clergy as well as the hardworking, very hardworking Israel Matters Committee for making tonight possible. I'm going straight to the introductions. I'm going to start with David Suisa, an ex-Palisadian who is publisher and editor-in-chief of the largest Jewish weekly newspaper outside of New York City, the Jewish Journal, and the U.S.'s most widely read Jewish news site, jewishjournal.com. David is an award-winning columnist, writing weekly for the last 12 years with brilliant insight on topics relevant to Jews everywhere, Israel, politics, the Middle East, and social issues that impact us all. Prior to the Jewish Journal, David was founder and CEO of Suisa Miller Advertising, a marketing firm named Agency of the Year by USA Today. He sold his company in 2006 to devote himself full-time to his first passion, Israel and the Jewish world. And we are very lucky for that, David. Yes. Amen. Under David's leadership at the Jewish Journal, he has created a tent large enough for all voices to be heard, left, right, and center, with civility and respect for all. 
David is an influencer, one of our community's most significant voices, and a Jewish leader well-suited for the times in which we live. Now my Rick Enten, my dear friend and Israel Matters co-chair, who has been a member of k Israel for 25 years, volunteering as a past board trustee and too many other committees to list. He was the creator of KI's Mitzvah Circle and the original chair of KI Israel Matters Committee. Rick has also been involved in various leadership positions in the Los Angeles community, including past chair of the real estate and construction division of the Jewish Federation of LA, Wexner Heritage Foundation Fellow, past chairman of the board of Hello 818, and annual giving chair at Marquez School. Yay, Marquez. Yeah. <laughs> he is currently on the LA Leadership Council of Birthright. He also recently finished a term on the Campus Activities Committee at Federation, where he was involved in the funding of Jewish life at our local colleges and universities. Bef- no further ado, Rick and David. Well, thank you all so much for coming out on such an auspicious time, auspicious week. Um, really, coming out for KI Comedy Night is really a huge commitment, and, and we so appreciate it. Um, before we start, just picking up on what, what Rabbi Hyman said, something very personal. I come here tonight and my preparation for this event brought a deep level of sadness. Um, What Michelle didn't mention is I've been to Israel over 12 times, I think, the latest last month in October. The first time I went, 1979, I was 19 years old. And I looked at, and everybody else who was 19 years old was serving the IDF, young men and women, protecting the borders of Israel. And when I went back this month, I didn't miss the fact that Dane and I have 19-year-old twins and a 21-year-old daughter. And looking at, and we had a big opportunity to meet with those soldiers. And you know what they all said? A lie. It's on me. It's my responsibility. It's my shift. Doesn't matter the politics. Doesn't matter how religious you are. So in that tone, I want to wish everybody a happy Veterans Day and ask first and foremost if there are any veterans here, uh, either from the IDF or from armed forces in the US or anywhere else, I'd like you to please just stand up for a moment for all the veterans. Um, A special shout out to uh, my very dear friend and our speaker last year for this event, Larry Greenfield, um, who's also one of the veterans who stood up. So now, without further ado, uh, David, it's not like we've got a lot to cover. Um, So you talk and you write a lot about elevating the conversation at the Jewish Journal. Um, You've been in charge now as the publisher and editor-in-chief for a little over a year, uh, but you were there for much longer. I was an avid reader of your column and Rob Eshman's columns. So the first question is, and I think it's an important one, how are you really trying to help frame the conversation with what's going on between the diaspora and Israel right now? Well, first, it's great to be here. I'm back home. I spent seven years in Pacific Palisades, seven great years. We used to go to Mort's, <laughs> and the Chabad, and all, the, all those restaurants and cafes. We had a special place in our heart for Pacific Palisades. I think we called it Hasidic Palisades. <laughs> yeah. it's really, it's like an enclave. It's totally separate from the rest of LA. So now I'm, I moved with the Jews, Pico Robertson. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I inherited the title editor in chief about a year and two months ago. And on my first day as editor, somebody came into my office and said, uh, it was a writer. And the writer shared uh, real truism in journalism. And she said, you know, David, if we get angry letters from the right and we get angry letters from the left, it means we're doing something right. (laughs) I was haunted by that phrase. And I went home and I'm thinking, hmm, so my goal will be to generate anger throughout the (laughs) community, left and right, and then I'll know I'll be doing well. 
And I was raised by a father who was allergic to anger. Um, in Casablanca, in Morocco, anger was, was a big no-no in my, in my family. So the, the journalist who said that to me didn't know that. So it was not, it's not the right thing to say to me. <laughs> but anger. And it became my mantra since my first day as editor-in-chief. And I came up with a line that said, I'd like to ignite thought, not anger. And I literally wrote that line in my first column as editor-in-chief. My goal will be to ignite thought, not anger. And I, I have to tell you that that journalist has guided me every day as, edit as editor-in-chief, right up until today. There's stuff that I get. I'll give you an example, great example. A few weeks ago, good friends of mine, soup, you know, Great Zionist, extremely critical of Israel and extremely critical of President Trump. They sent me a great piece called Why Trump is Bad for Israel. It was a great piece. And they challenged me to print it. And I said, I will absolutely print it. And then I went, called a good friend of mine in Israel, very knowledgeable, David Hazoni, who used to run a journal. And then he gave another take. So you open up the Jewish journal, why Trump is bad for Israel, why Trump is good for Israel, you guys decide. Well, we're going to get to that too. We're going to get, <laughs> but I'm, I'm giving you an example of trying to um, take the conversation in a deeper direction. Because I think there was so much, I inherited a community that was just at each other's throats. And part of that is a sense of diminished conversation. So but can I, can I, I interject yeah. there and... Uh, we actually, much like last year, there's a lot of ground we want to cover. But I want to ask you, I want to do the power of 10, the zoom in, zoom out. And I want everybody to just take a moment and imagine one of those high-powered digital satellites. And if you zoom in down, 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 down on the land of Israel, and you come up to the 1967 border, and you find a checkpoint, and the camera zooms in on a woman, Palestinian woman, with her young daughter going through the checkpoint, passing through the metal detector, being frisked by a young female Israeli soldier. Okay? That frames one conversation. Now, power of 10, you zoom out, and suddenly you're looking through the satellite camera on the whole of the Middle East. And you see the existential threat of Iran, and Israel surrounded by 20 of 22 Arab countries that don't recognize its right to exist. So, how do we even start the conversation when you have organizations in the Jewish world, good-hearted, good-minded, but they seem to be focusing on such a single issue? I have an answer for you. You zoom out even more. You zoom out to the year of the destruction of the Second Temple in the year 70. When people ask me what my connection is with Israel, is I go back really far. I was actually thinking that I would create a metaphor tonight that I've never used before, and I really racked my brains to come up with one. So I have thought of one. <laughs> so you're my guinea pigs. So you're, uh, <clears throat> you're 29 years old. You marry somebody who's also 29, and you have a couple, a couple of 29 years old, and they're desperate to start a family. And the wife cannot get pregnant. And for years and years and years, they try all the fertility treatments. Finally, 19 years later, what's 19 plus 29? A miracle happens. She's 48 years old, and she delivers a beautiful baby boy. Now that baby boy becomes a very complicated kid, He's very smart, little wise ass, He's troublesome. That boy for me is Israel. It, we waited, my ancestors waited 1900 years to have this boy, this girl, this child, right? My grandfather in Casablanca, Morocco had a fantastic business selling teas and spices in Casablanca. And when Israel was born, he didn't make Aliyah, he went home because he would pray in synagogue and he knows that his father prayed and his father's father going back to the year 70. They pray three times a day to come home to Zion. So for me, 
When I look at the scene that Rick mentioned and the Palestinian at the, at the checkpoint, or I look at the situation from Israel's side or from the Palestinian side, my first, my starting point is that I waited 19 years to have a kid. I waited 1,900 years to come to Israel. And that's what I call the goosebumps. You Ashkenazim, you call it the kishkas. Yeah. And it, for me, it's the starting point of every conversation about Israel is we waited 1,900 years to come home. Now we can talk. Okay. Now we can talk. Now let's talk. Because it's the, it, it, the minute you understand the yearning of centuries, it's the greatest experience of yearning in human history. You've got to figure after 400 years, one of the guys would say, you know that, enough. It ain't going to happen. Let's move on. And then at some point said, no, 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 we're not moving on. We're waiting and waiting and waiting. And I am blessed to be born in the generation that gets to go over the, the, the finish line. How, how privileged is that? And with all the criticism I, I uh, direct at Israel, and I've written the most horrendous criticism against the chief rabbinate and the Haredi, you name it. I want a two-state solution more than Mahmoud Abbas. I do. The Palestinian state would be the greatest thing that could ever happen to Israel. So nobody can out-criticize Israel for me. But I criticize it after waiting 19 years for my baby and after waiting 1900 years. So when it comes from that, then all of a sudden all the criticism takes on a completely different. And I think what's happened is uh, so many Jews don't have the goosebumps. So that Israel becomes just an idea. And the Israel that they've seen, especially in the past 30 years, has been the Israel of occupation. And I understand them, by the way. And if all you know is the Israel of occupation, then it's a negative relationship that you develop. And hopefully tonight we can engage with Rick and, in a conversation that's, that's richer and deeper and just a little more complex. You know, I, so, so, David, yeah, what, what, what you call goosebumps, I call family. Because I came from a secular, Zionistic, Encino family. And when I first went to that Israel, I fell in love. And uh, many people, and that's where the sadness comes from, that things have become so divisive. Because when you're in family, you don't choose whether or not to be in a family. You may not always like your family. But you know what? You show up for the Thanksgiving table. And now, listening to Rabbi Donio Hartman last week speak, he talked about part of the problem is, Jews in the diaspora no longer feel like it's family. They feel like consumers. And guess what? When you're a consumer, you can choose to like the product. You can choose not to buy the product. You can work against the product. So my next question for you, and I want to move on to this issue of the diaspora-Israel relations. And you gave me the perfect setup. Because the combined Jewish federations had their general assembly in Tel Aviv last month. Thousands of Jews, half Israeli, half from mostly North America, but all over the world. And the tagline was we need to talk. So David, the next week, writes a piece with the headline says, we need to listen. So my question is, what do the Israelis need to listen to that the diaspora has to say that they're not hearing? And what do we need to hear from the Israelis that we really need to listen and hear from them? That's a good question, Rick. You know, when I first saw We Need to Talk, I mean, that's the kind of stuff you say when you want to fire somebody. Like, yeah, we need to talk. Here's, here's the prenup. We need to talk. Uh, and I don't, think they, I, I, I don't think it was purposeful. I think they, they really meant well. Um, but the, uh, the idea was that the relationship had reached a little bit of a crisis point. And it seemed as if the, the grievances were like accumulating. And it was so offensive to us to have a deal for the, at, the, at the Western Wall and then they pull back on the deal. It's offensive. And to think that they would like uh, offend the, the denominations that we cherish in America, reform and conservative, it's so, it's so foreign to us to feel as Jews that were sort of rejected by the Jewish land. It's foreign. We can't even comprehend how that would happened, right? So I wrote a, a column on we need to listen because listening is the first sign of love. If 
I listen to you, I make you feel needed. I'm giving you a chance to give. And I was hoping to create a vehicle of mutual listening. Um, I spent 48 hours this week literally up because I was petrified that my son was going to go into Gaza. I didn't tell him that because I didn't want to scare him. But he's a combat engineer in the IDF and they, he was picked out of this whole unit to go into special training for the tunnels. He's a, he's a sweet kid from Pico Robertson. He's like, he was raised in this overprotected world. He had a charmed life up until he was 18. And then one day he says, I want to go to the army. And for the past year and, and a month, he's been training and basic training to be a warrior. And I'm petrified and I'm following the news. I have connections in the Israeli government. I'm calling everybody I know. I'm like begging Bibi not to start a war. I was way to the left of all my friends on J Street. And I don't know how to overstate the horror that you feel inside of you. You all, I'm sure, have kids. I can't overstate the, the horror that I felt inside of me to know that my boy might go in, in, in harm's way. And the reason I bring that up is because Rick was talking about listening. And for me, the, the deepest kind of listening that I can do with Israelis is to sort of understand exactly what I just said. I've never met an Israeli, and I've been there maybe 50 times. I've met thousands of Israelis. I've never met an Israeli who doesn't have a war story, who doesn't know a neighbor who lost a friend in a terrorist attack, who lost somebody in this war, that war, this war. You, good luck finding an Israeli who doesn't have a story of loss, of human loss, either through war or through a terrorist attack, right? So for me, that's my starting point when I listen to Israelis, is I try to have empathy for their position, which means I'm going to be very humble before I go to them and say, hey, I know what you need. Trust me. I know. What you're doing to the Palestinians is totally wrong. And I realized this week, I wanted peace more than any human I ever met. So I'm thinking, if I want peace, and I'm known as a, a Sephardic hothead, I'm like a right winger, right? So if I want peace so bad, I can't imagine an Israeli who wouldn't want peace. Because peace means my kids are going to live. So I'm saying all this in the spirit of listening. Because it's difficult for us who don't have a kid that's going to go into harm's way to really try to have empathy for Israeli voters. So my first point with Israeli, I have a certain faith when it comes to security, I'm not going to tell them what to do. Not me. I have a little faith in Israeli voters when it comes to security. When it comes to everything else, I will give them a piece of my mind. I have, I have no patience for the corruption. I have no patience for the Haredi chief rabbinate. I've written about this. There's a lot of mistakes that they make. They are a work in progress. They're a mess in progress. <laughs> We're going to get there too. Yeah. So, so listening. Now, Maybe. what can they listen to us? They can listen to us in America. Like, you got to listen. You know, one of the best ideas I heard from the conference was reverse birthright. Just like we have Jews who go to Israel and get to know Israelis, we need to bring Israelis to America so they get to know us. That hasn't happened. So, you know, by the way, every question he gives, I can talk for two hours. I'm not going to. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so on that note, uh, so we're going to move to a really light topic. Light? I don't light know topic. Light. Um, American Jews and politics. Like this whole evening is about cognitive dissonance, right? Nothing seems to make sense. So recent poll, 77% of American Jews, it says here unfavorable view of President Trump. They hate President Trump. Many express a great alarm 
about Trump's politics of fear over hope. And many liberal Jews and traditionally minded thinking people, like all these traditional values, it goes against what Trump stands for. Okay, yet you've got a lot of people saying, but he's good for the Jews. And I'm not going to list it, but he's done a number of bold moves that presidents before have promised and not done. So um, the question really is with respect to um, Trump and the Jews, like how are we to deal with this cognitive dissonance? Good luck. <laughs> the Trump thing is a big mess because you're obligated to abhor his, his character flaw. I mean, it's just, it's over the top. There's nobody that can defend the horrendous behavior. And it's like, it's, it's almost embarrassing. So I'm, I'm there with all of you, whoever is. I'm all the way there, you know. Uh, but the cognitive dissonance is real. It's real and it's very complicated. I had a Shabbat dinner with a, a famous philosopher and I tried to bring up a conversation. I said, you know, professor, uh, I'm in trouble with the law and I might go to jail. And I have two potential lawyers. The first one's a total jerk. He's impolite, he's rude, he's unethical, he's terrible. He's horrible. I would never invite him to my Shabbat table. The second one's real sweet. He's a gentleman. He's classy and he's dignified. But the first one can get me out of jail. What do you do? What do you do? It's a, it's a, it's a real issue. Because, you know, you have this outcome. You have character flaws versus outcome. So you have these outcomes. For example, the, the lowest unemployment among Hispanics. The lowest unemployment among African Americans. And you have these positive outcomes. A better deal with this and then the stuff with Israel. There's so many arguments to say why Israel <coughs> is in a better position now. And you can disagree with that. But there's a lot. But the point I'm trying to make is that it's very complicated. And it's not as simple as saying I'm going to hate everything he does because I hate his character. Because there's a real thing called outcome. I used to, I was very close with George Bush's best friend. He passed away last year. His name was Donald Etra. He was a neighbor of mine. And he would always tell me about George Bush because he was invited there. He would, he would sleep at the White House regularly. They were buddies in college. They were roommates. And they stayed best friends. And he would always tell me what a decent man George Bush was. How much he loved the Jews. A real gentleman. He was classy. He was decent. And he made the dumbest move in U.S. history. He squandered $5 trillion dollars on this dumbest war in Iraq, we could have fixed the homeless problem, the educational problem, we could have fixed the infrastructure, we could have fixed climate change with five trillion dollars, not to mention 20,000 lives that we squandered on a country that couldn't even say thank you. And we squandered on a war that empowered the Shiite regime of, of Iran. So here's a classy gentleman who has the horrible outcome and then you have a pig like Trump, who would probably say, you know what, that Iraq war is a ripoff. I'm not going in. That's a ripoff. My only point is that it's very complicated. Okay, so I want to I expand the complication before we move on. Classic Jewish statement. Okay, and like, so this was like, you know, an Ashkenazi and a Sephardic walk into a bar. Like, D David and I, like, the, the first phone call we met, he says, Rick, Rick, he goes, we could do this tomorrow. Like, we don't need to talk. He goes, what do you do? You're so Ashkenazi. You want to write questions? You want to meet? You yeah, want to talk? So, okay. <laughs> so anyway, so here's the cue. Okay, Amanda Berman. Yes. And the question is that there is a lot of concern amongst progressives progressive Jews who can no longer play in the progressive pond because you can't be pro-Zionism and pro-progressive. And I, I won't list the examples, but I'd like you to just quickly respond to this um, and, uh, and then we'll move on. Well, you know, we got all the strikes against us. If you want to be unpopular today, you got to look white, Western, powerful and successful. If you want to be popular, you've got to not white, weak, powerless, and be a real victim, right? And Israel, unfortunately, 
They had the nerve to become a successful country. It's not very white anymore. The image is white. It's totally not a white country. But the image is white and Western. So we're pushing water uphill in terms of trying to gain the sympathy of the liberal activism, especially on college campuses. And that's the reality of the situation. I think when you hear what Rick just said, these poor liberal Jews on campuses, they want to go and be involved with you know, the rights of gays and the rights of African Americans. They want to join Black Lives Matter on campuses. All these causes and climate change. And every time they approach, they find out that, oh, you're pro-Israel, get out. And they're shaken to their core. They're not allowed to become liberals. It's really a sort of a tragic situation. They call it intersectionality. And for better or for worse, you know, Israel's become a not a totally dirty word, a, a tainted word, a problematic word, uh, because the BDS movement, the boycott divestment, one of the evils of the movement is that it's not about boycotting Israel. It's about poisoning the brand of Israel. And they've done an amazing job because they've taken everything I've just said, powerful, rich, white, colonialist, Western, we got all of them, and they've used it against Israel. Never mind that, oh my God, don't get me started. I'm going to stop here because I've got another hour on this. And I know Rick is the Ashkenazi guy. He's looking at me. He's giving me an Ashkenazi look now. Not, not really. I'm, so I'm, just... I'm, to, so I'm just going to give you little doses. <laughs> but the, we were at a movie the other night. He and I, a couple nights ago. When was it? Wednesday night. Wednesday night. If there was ever a movie to make you fall in love with Israel, that was it. You see these Israelis who go around the world to fix the water problems in India and in Africa. And I was there, actually. And California. Days. And California. And water to Jordan. Yeah, and water to Jordan. It's unbelievable. If there was ever a movie that really would give you the goosebumps about Israelis who's not enough that we fix the water problem in Israel, we want to go around the world. And Rick and I go in, it's at the CAA building in Century City, and of course, what do we see? Demonstrators against Israel. SJP, is, it, is that what No, were? no, it was, at, it was Jewish Voice for Peace. So they were all primarily 60-year-old white Jewish people um, with holding signs that said, Israel's an apartheid state, race shouldn't be allocated, or water shouldn't be allocated by race. They couldn't pick a night for the IDF. They had to pick a night where we helped the world with water. But that's, you know, it's emblematic of so, the situation that Israel could never win. You know, it's, it's framing the conversation. You know, Israel, sustainable nation. Israel, the racist state. Um, so, another light topic. Um, I do want to interrupt, though, Rick, for this. Before we go away from this framing the conversation issue, have you guys heard of If Not Now? They're really very aggressive anti-occupation movement. They're like a spin-off of J Street. And they do PR stunts. They, they get arrested. A couple years ago, they were in the lobby of the ADL building in New York. And I was there. I was meeting with the ADL. And they're there right before Pesach. And they want to get arrested. Because their line was no liberation with occupation. The Pesach Seder is about liberation. Uh-uh. It's all about ending the occupation. Turns out, I got into a conversation with one of them. Very polite conversation. My friend Larry Greenfield always tells me, stay polite at all costs. So I said, very polite. We engage. And he tells me everything about the occupation and how it needs to end. And, of course, I totally agree with him. And then I said, you know, two months ago, I was in Ramallah. And I had coffee with one of the BMW dealers there. Very successful guy, blah, blah, blah. And I said to him, but the occupation. And he said, please don't leave. He thought I was Israeli. I said, please don't leave. I said, what do you mean? He said, the minute the IDF leaves, ISIS and Hamas come in and they chop our heads off. So I was speaking to this guy from If Not Now, that's desperate to end the occupation. I said, what you call the occupation, that Palestinian in Ramallah calls protection. 
It's complicated. So when Rick says, how do we reframe a conversation? This is a way of reframing it. As much as I'm desperate to end the occupation, I have to listen to this Palestinian who is afraid of what would happen after Israel leaves. Was that a good interruption? That was a good interruption. Okay, was it worth it? You know, I've yeah. never driven a BMW, but uh, that could be my next car. Um, you got to see Ramallah these days. It's pretty amazing. Uh, They're like building stuff there. Okay, so I want to I move on. And it doesn't matter whether it's the ADL or the FBI, all the statistics show that there's a rise in anti-Semitism in America and we know what's going on all over the world. More cognitive dissonance. Okay. Pittsburgh Post-Gazette prints on page one, headline, Hebrew letters, Yit Gadal V'Yit Gadash, the Jewish morning prayer. Churches in America are marching on the anniversary of Kristallnacht, holding candles, walking in vigil, to synagogues to hub their, their fellow Jews in faith. So, David, to what extent is anti-Semitism really framing you know, our Jewish narrative here in America? And to get my second question out, um, is anti-Semitism anti-Zionism, or is really anti-Zionism equal anti-Semitism? A lot of it is. The, the human brain is wired to put a bigger emphasis on trouble than on good news. Uh, if a tiger is coming towards you, it's more important to run away from the tiger than to go and get the vegetables or, or the food. And that's the way the human brain is wired to put trouble first. And media companies have taken full advantage of that. They make a lot more money when they give you trouble. I know we double our clicks on the Jewish Journal website if I put anti-Semitism uh, in the headlines. So, two points. One, the ADL study that said an, uh, anti-Semitism incidents are up 77%. Please Google it tonight. Challenge to the study. It's way overblown. And a brilliant analysis has been done. I forget the name. Apologize. But if you Google it, you'll see what I mean. It's overblown. Number two. Just think of how many synagogue services since George Washington made that great statement on the Jews. How many synagogue services have happened all through America? Tens of millions of synagogue services over the centuries. Just think of it. Maybe 50 million synagogue services. And just to think, only one time was there ever a Jew hater who came into a synagogue and shot Jews in over 200 years. Since the beginning of America, it only happened once. Do you know the only other time that somebody came into a synagogue and shot a Jew? Does anybody know? No, in America. The other time, some wise guy knows. 1966. In Detroit, it was a deranged Jew who shot Rabbi Adler. It's the only other time. So this is the very first time. But because the brain is wired for trouble, we went crazy. How do I, I'm at the journal. I get everything. Okay, but, but David... Uh, so the point I'm making is that America is the least anti-Semitic country in human history. Okay, but I want to ask one follow-up and okay. let you continue. Because there's a big concern amongst a lot of people that the current political rhetoric that's going on, and much of it coming out of our president's mouth, is contributing to this. Yeah, the, you know, it's a big debate now in the Jewish world. Is the anti-Semitism worse from the right or the left? You, I, I hear really good arguments that the bigger threat is coming from the left, because they use Israel as the, the shield. So the, uh, the sort of the BDS movement and the ethism from there and from the Farrakhan and that whole world. UCLA? UCLA, which the conference is starting tomorrow. That's a major, major. Unfortunately, our world has become so politicized into Democrats and Republicans. It's all about winning and losing. So when it happens from a Nazi, all the Democrats go crazy and this is a chance to beat up the Republicans 
and vice versa. And that's a sad situation because we ought to not pick our enemies. They're both bad. Um, and this is one of the least savory things about Pittsburgh. After Shabbat, I went in my emails and two, three hours. It's so bad, I don't even want to say it in public, but there were articles in the Jewish world. The bodies were still on the ground. It was only eight in the articles. They didn't even know it was 11. And immediately, within hours, Donald Trump, what have you done to America? There was the reaction to Pittsburgh. And I'm thinking, really? You, you want to win the midterm so bad? You hate Trump so bad that you can't even grieve for five minutes? How far are you going to go with this hatred? I don't mind hating Trump. But when you, go, when you hate him so bad that you use this horrible, horrible thing of dead Jewish bodies in a synagogue and the first thing that comes to your mind is let's beat up Trump. It's not good. It's not good for the conversation. It's not good for the Jews. It's not good for America. So we've lost the ability to temper our emotions. And we've let politics dominate our consciousness. And it's about winning and losing. And I see it on both sides. So when the right sees something that's Farrakhan related, they use it to beat up the Democrats and vice versa. What do we try to do with the journal? We try to sort of bring out all the sides so that we don't ignite anger, but we ignite thought. And I'm sad to say there's not enough thought that's going into this when um, this, this immigration situation, you know. If you reframe the problem of the migrants, this caravan that they call, right? If you reframe it as it is utterly immoral to separate a mother from her kid, there's nothing to talk about. You win. We all agree. If you reframe the immigration dilemma as we can't allow thugs and gangsters to come into our country and do harm, there's nothing to talk about. The only time the conversation gets interesting is when you pull back, like he was saying. You pull back, and then you try to think about solutions. And you look at different factors. That's when the conversation becomes really interesting. That's when you see we might find things in common. But we have an interest, an incentive, to reframe all issues in a very small way, small emotional way, because that's how we can win. I know that if I reframe immigration dilemma, as you, it says in the Torah 36 times, we've got to care for the other and we've got to care for the stranger. I'm not gonna, ever going to disagree with you. But we're Jews. We're supposed to value complexity. But we've allowed ourselves to be contaminated by this win-lose mentality in the American conversation. So, I know I'm veering off, so... No, you're, it, Sorry. no because... I mean, the theme of the evening, the American Jews and Israel, the relationship, the complexity, the cognitive dissonance. It's just like, the problem is that every one of these issues, they all follow the same pattern. So the next thing I want to ask you about is something which is very important to this community, very important to many American Jews, and that is the issue of religious pluralism. So there's many people in our community who look at what's going on with the Orthodox rabbi control in Israel. And again, I'm not going to list the issues. I'll let you talk about them. But the, 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 you know, we had a nut Hoffman from Women of the Wall on this sanctuary floor speaking last month. And again, it's an opportunity of how do you frame the issue. Women at the Wall frame the issue that women should be able to read Torah at the wall and wear talit. Okay. My daughter was bat mitzvah on this floor wearing talit and reading Torah. Okay. There's bigger issues. So the question really is, um, and I hope it's not a, um, a sad rhetorical one, but what are the prospects of helping to reconcile some of the ultra-Orthodox control of Jewish law in Israel with the desire of many in the diaspora for pluralism? Well, they're going to have to separate church and state, and they need a prime minister that doesn't make a deal with the Haredi for the coalition. It's utterly critical.
that the next coalition does not include the Haredi uh, parties in the governing coalition because it's the Taliban. And if they could, they'd have a law putting me in jail if I drove on Shabbat. It's crazy. One of the geniuses of Israel is we've enabled to somehow, you know, have a reasonable separation, church and state, but it still hasn't gone far enough. As far as the issue of denominations, Israel's become sort of a Sephardic country in the sense of traditionalism. In the Sephardic tradition, you, you can drive on Shabbat, you can smoke cigarettes and everything, but when you go to synagogue, you go to a traditional synagogue. And that's the Israeli way. Israelis are not looking for alternate synagogues. It's just not, it's not the thing in Israel. They're not, they're not, it's not like in America where we needed different denominations. We couldn't live in America without a reform movement and a reconstructionist movement and a humanist movement and a conservative movement and even within orthodoxy. The, the, the dynamics are completely different. So what we need in America is not necessarily what they need in Israel. And that's why it's so important not to take things personally. It's not about them trying to hurt us. It's about them living a completely different type of Judaism. A Judaism that doesn't think of denominations. They don't even think of a woman praying at the wall. But I'll tell you about the woman at the wall. The head of the reform movement, Rick Jacobs, had a great coffee with him and told him I'm going to Israel next week. He says, you've got to meet my person. Religious Action Center, I think it's what it's called. Iraq. Was, yeah, yeah. Israel so I, religious... I had a wonderful morning with her. It was great. I said, show me the Robinson's Arch. I wanted to see that whole different area that was allowed for non-Orthodox prayer. And I wrote a column right away. And you know what I wrote? I prefer this wall to the other one. You know why? It had these huge stones that were on the ground, which for me, I had a more Jewish experience in front of that wall than the other one, which is arrogant and straight. This is the Jewish wall. Because Jewish is a work in progress. We're a broken people in a broken world that's always trying to repair it. I actually had a deeper experience in the non-Orthodox part. Okay, but, but David, I want to just... I wanna... So, look, I'm adding complexity to the conversation. Okay, I want to dig a little what deeper. I'm doing. And we don't need to take things personally. I want to dig a little deeper. Our rabbis at this synagogue are not recognized as rabbis in Israel. You know, whether it's conversion, whether it's who is a Jew, whether it's prayer at the wall, um, it's a very personal issue for a lot of people. So there's this big push on pluralism. So, you know, sometimes I think that does, then the question is, does the new pluralism mean they have to accept us, but we don't have to accept them? Look, there's going to be issues that divide us. You know, imagine 98% uh, of the people we live with are not Jewish. And over there, 100% of the people they hang out with are Jewish. How could we ever expect that we would be in agreement on major issues? How is that realistic? They're a completely different society. So I look at these issues that divide us as normal normal. And if we could start looking and not panic at these sources of division, I think we might eventually get to some kind of a point where we could listen more to each other. But the first starting point is you've got to get the Haredi out of the coalition. I think for me, and you know, I've, I've met with the government. I have a little bit of influence, not too much, but I, every time I meet somebody high up I'm like a broken record. You got to get the Haredi mouth of the coalition. By the way, there's movement in Israel. Movement. The right, well, let's, let's, we'll try and save a little time for that. So, look, I want to I want to cover a couple more topics. I want to be respectful of our audience. I imagine somebody out here might have a question, so I do want to save some time um, quickly, because I know you did a tremendous piece on this in the Jewish Journal. I did. 
uh, you arranged it. Um, the Israel as a nation state, the new nation state uh, law. If we can just just take a minute or two, what is all the balagan? Well, uh, the, the, if I can summarize 4,000 words. And, and, and maybe for those who may not be as familiar, just quickly explain um, what it is. Look, there were things missing in all the basic laws, and they were taking all these symbols of Judaism. They wanted to formalize the Jewish nature of the state. And the biggest criticism is what they forgot to include. And the, but the rebuttal to that criticism is that it was included in other basic laws. It's a genuine point of contention. And you, there are arguments on both sides. If you really want to do a deep dive, jewishjournal.com, Emmanuel Nabon, he wrote a 4,000 piece explanation and defense of the nation state law. My point, I don't think it justified the hysterics uh, against the law, which I think for me is the number one issue is what kind of tone, what kind of body language, kind of emotion we use in criticism. So to, and what I saw in the Jewish world, there was a movement of leftist reform groups that decided to do a petition online. Basically, they said, here are the 62 members of the Knesset who voted for this terrible law. When they come to America, ask them these five tough questions. And it's all online. I took these five questions and I sent it to my expert in Israel. And he wrote a 4,000 piece answer to the five questions. It was brilliant. The head of J Street emailed me and was so impressed. He said, this is a very thoughtful answer. There was no emotion. There's not one ounce of emotion in the answer. He just very calmly answered all the questions. You might end up disagreeing with everything he said. But the one thing you'll never say is he was angry, he was emotional, he was like that, patronizing, none of that. For me, that's the number one issue. How do we talk? Do we go hysterical against the nation state law or do we actually read it and have a smart conversation? Please go on and, and tell me what you think. You can email me after you read it. That's my answer on nation state law. Thank you. It's, um, it's a really interesting take on a controversial subject. Um, and we're just, we're, we are so skinning the surface that the last topic that I want to take just five minutes on, it's not a big topic, it's very narrow, Israel on the world stage, um, nothing serious. Mm. Um, but, you know, we have to stop for a moment tonight and recognize in the past few days there were hundreds of rockets sent from Gaza um, down into southern Israel. Um, it's potentially bringing down the Netanyahu coalition because the defense minister resigned. Um, you know, an anti-tank missile was fired at a bus carrying 50 Israeli soldiers, and by the grace of God, those soldiers had just left the bus, and the only person killed was the Arab bus driver. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the issue is there's two narratives on Israel. One, that Israel responds disproportionately, and this is why the, the, the defense minister left. He said, you know what? We've been taking rockets. We've been people tunnels. We've been taking all of this. We need to go in, and Israel needs to protect itself. And the other narrative, which, believe it or not, is Netanyahu, the centrist. He's been criticized from the right. He says, you know what? We've gone in there with some targeted attacks. We've caused some pain, and we're going to have this ceasefire, and we're going to stop. So really, the, um, the question becomes, has it become so controversial to say that the first priority of country should be safety and security um, over inconvenience. Like, what are the Israelis to do out of all of this? Look, uh, Bibi is very media savvy. And I can tell you that uh, he understands the Hamas strategy in Gaza. And forgive me for being a little blunt. He understands that the strategy is please come kill our children so we can win the media war. Please. And that's why all the rocket launchers are in schools, are in mosques, are in hospitals, are in UN buildings. It's not a coincidence. And they know that Israel turns itself into pretzels 
to not have civilian casualties, but it's impossible to avoid them. So I think Bibi is very aware of this uh, media strategy from the other side. As far as Israel's position in the world, I'll make two comments on it. One of them is a little bit of a wise-ass comment, and the second one is more serious. First one's wise-ass. It's uh, the Sephardic tradition that says bad news takes away the evil eye. Oh. So Israel has been trying to get the world to love it for like 20 years, 30 years. And no matter what Israel does, you still get 90% of the resolutions of the UN all against Israel, like totally over-the-top disproportionate condemnation of Israel. They realize after 30 years, they're never going to love us. But I th they're like the happiest country on the planet. You go to Israel, I think it's the best kept secret is how happy they are. So they see all the bad news as like takes away the evil eye and we're happy. The second point I want to make is more serious, which is there's a paradigm shift that's happened in the last five years. It used to be that Israel wanted the world to love it. But now they realize that the world needs Israel. And if there's something we've seen with the relationships with India, with China, with Africa, I mean, people need to drink. They're a leader in cybersecurity. I know that Europe is using Israel to help fight terrorism. So throughout the world, there are countries now that used to say, fix the Palestinian problem, then we'll do business with you. They don't say that anymore because they really need Israel's know-how. And that's a paradigm shift. Is the world needs Israel. I may not like you, but I need you. It's a huge shift. And if you're an Israel lover, you should be very happy about it. So I was thinking when we first talked about this several months ago that we'd have an opportunity to talk about the Trump peace plan. So, um, the famous Trump peace plan. So uh, yeah. your, your, oh your contacts um, in Israel and the government are saying, what? <laughs> I've literally been trying to find out what this police plan is. You know, my writer, Shmuel Rosner, is very connected. I said, just find out what's in that stupid plan. Uh, so I'll tell you what I've heard. Not totally reliable, but as reliable as I can get. Um, they're going to try to make a deal that doesn't force settlers to leave. That sort of allows, because they realize that there are some issues that are just too difficult to accomplish. And forcing 100,000 Jews out of their homes, it's just potential civil war. And I think they've studied the problem so much that uh, that's one. Number, number two... Uh, there's going to be a capital in Jerusalem, in a certain part of Jerusalem. And it's going to be very difficult for I Israel to sort of swallow that. It's not going to be in Abu Dis. This is the second thing uh, I've heard. And then the third thing I've heard is you've already seen it, which is going to be a huge investment in bottom-up, in humanitarian and economic aid to really give the Palestinians something to lose. And then the fourth thing, which we know already, is the involvement of other uh, nation states, like whether it's Saudi Arabia or Egypt or Jordan. What do I think is going to happen? Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. And the reason nothing's going to happen is because we need a Palestinian state more than the Palestinians do. Because a Palestinian state will save the future of Israel. The Palestinian state will save the future of Zionism as a Jewish democracy. We've been telling the Palestinians for 20 years that it's the most important thing for us is to create a Palestinian state so that we don't have to occupy 2 million um, non-Jews and if we give them the right to vote then all of a sudden waiting 1900 years to come home to a Jewish state becomes coming home to an Arab state. And that's that's not an option. And I think the Palestinians have figured out that we need a Palestinian state a lot more than they do. And the only way anything good, you can listen to my podcast that I did with Uri Dromi yesterday, it just went up. The only way is going to be something unilateral. We're going to have to ram a state down their throat. 
Anything good for the Israel, anything good for the Jews, they will never sign. Impossible. Now, you know, have you ever heard something like this? I don't think so. I said, what I've said to you, I said it to Dory Gold, who's one of the experts in this field. I, I sat with him a year ago, he was in LA, and I said to him, I said, Dory, you're asking the biggest haters of Zionism to save Zionism. I don't want to pat myself on the back, but when I told him that, he looked at me and said, that's brilliant. Literally, brilliant. This is a guy who knows a hundred times more than I do. He's been in all the peace uh, processes. And he said, that's brilliant. We're asking the biggest haters of Zionism to save Zionism. Meanwhile, there's no incentive for Palestinian leaders who have private jets, who have private uh, fancy villas, who send their kids to private schools in England and have hundreds of millions of dollars in Swiss bank accounts. Why end the occupation? The occupation is like a knife that they can stab Israel with all day long. The occupation is this incredible ATM machine. As long as the occupation continues, the money keeps flowing in. And the occupation means that ISIS is not going to come in and chop their heads off. They have zero incentive to end the occupation. Zero. We have an incentive to end it. Isn't it, isn't it nice to end on an upbeat note? <laughs> it is upbeat. You know why it's upbeat? Because we get clarity. Because for 20 years you've been hearing... We have to give them a state. We have to give, them a, we have to give us a state. Okay, so David, another thing when we first talked, um, and I think we both broke the promises, we're really lousy role models up here. Because I said I'm going to ask really short questions and you're going to give short answers. And do short answers. I'm Sephardic. We don't do short answers. Right, and I'm, I'm, I'm Ashkenazi, and I'm so they're all typed out. Okay? <laughs> so we really want to open up to the audience. Um, we've got Rachel and Rebecca, who are two of our amazing staff here at KI, who have handheld microphones. Um, everybody has to not do what we do. We need a short question. If you disagree with David, stand up first. Um, take the microphone. Please ask your question. We'd like to try and um, do this for a little bit. And... Um, and we'll go. So this woman's eye I caught first in the back row, and then uh, we're going to get this gentleman and then Evelyn Shoshani. We've got to pick up another Sephardic here, especially she's a guest in our house. Seriously? Yes. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, the organization Un UNWA, I, don't, I know I may not be pronouncing that Unwa. correctly. It's the only, as I understand, it's the only organization in the world that counts every descendant and relative of somebody that was displaced as a refugee as a refugee in order to calculate what kind of funding they need. And, we, and the United States recently pulled funding. But it's the only refugee organization that tabulates how many refugees there are by all the descendants of somebody that was displaced in 1948, the Nakba. Do you see an aggressive effort to redefine what a refugee is as opposed to every descendant and cousin and relative or, and to educate the public about that? I mean, It's the first time under this administration uh, since the beginning of the State of Israel. It's the first U.S. administration that has brought that issue up on the table, which is, <coughs> you know, any therapist will tell you but if you live your life like a victim, you can't, you can't be happy. You can't lead a meaningful, successful life if all you do is act like a victim all day long. And the Palestinians have been encouraged and incentivized to be victims for the past 70 years. And there's no way to make a deal. There's no way to have any kind of a healthy uh, relationship if one side worships victimhood. Uh, Israel had every reason to become the biggest victims on the planet. We lost six million. And then still, we rolled up our sleeve and realized that victimhood would be suicidal for, uh, the, for the state of Israel. Uh, my wish is that there would have been no, no UNRWA. My wish would have been that they would have sort of, you know, build rather than just, I've been there. I've been in these refugee camps. You're like, they got a big key inside the the little shacks, and it's the key to their house in Haifa. It's not going to happen. 
you know, but they're, they're like, I don't know what the word is, they're constantly poisoned by their leaders who promise them that they're all going to go back to Haifa, all five million of them, and back to Tel Aviv. And the leaders who say this know that it's not true. They know it's never going to happen. But still, they poison them with these fantasies, and these fantasies only per perpetuate this sense of victimhood. If there's one reason where okay. Israel's been such a success, it has no patience, tolerance, or the luxury of being a victim. Uh, the gentleman. Yeah, you mentioned the media game that Hamas plays. Why does essentially all the media allow it to play that game? The game that which plays? I'm sorry. Hamas. Hamas. Right. Why does what? I, I'm sorry. I you mentioned that Hamas wants their children and their hospitals to be Correct. bombed because they play the media game that Israel overreacts. Correct. If we all know that this game is being played, why does the media go along with it? Oh, it's a great question. You know, I had that conversation with my brother yesterday. He said, if the media was, was smart and they would be able to expose that technique. So why does the media go along? Because it's, a, it's called confirmation bias. The media has a, bi a, a narrative. All it's a, most mainstream media, let me tell you, I'm a journalist. And if I'm in a war zone and I find out that there's a hospital with 10 kids who were killed, I don't really care that Hamas used it as a trick. I know that if I can get a picture on AP wire, and if I can get a story out, it's intoxicating. So you've got hundreds of reporters all over the war zone. Hamas is making it very easy for them. Uh, and you can see the reporting. So I'm not here going to immediately just blame them. I know as a journalist, it's intoxicating to go to where the people are dying. And they, the, the media has told the Israelis, if you want us to like you, you've got to start dying more. <laughs> and Israel has said, no deal. Okay. We're not making that deal. Um, next and if you love Israel, you should be happy they said no deal. Um, Evelyn, raise your hand. There you go. So you started the evening out by saying that um, coming to Israel was returning home for you and for many generations, the analogy of the 19-year-old baby. Yet you ended the talk by um, referring to is Israel as the occupation. How can you reconcile those two? Oh, I think the, 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 the miracle of the 67 war became the biggest curse on Israel. You know, it, um, it put Israel in a situation of checkmate. The, the presence of Judea and Samaria, it's really one of the most intractable problems you can ever imagine. Uh, Yossi Klein Alibi, who I strongly urge you to read, he's a very close friend of mine, he wrote a book, Letters, Palestinian Neighbors. He had the best description of the Palestinian conflict and the occupation that I've ever heard. He said, Leaving the West Bank is an existential threat to Israel. Staying in the West Bank is an existential threat to Israel. This captures the dilemma better than anything I can think of. So when I talk about a returning home, I want to return home to a Jewish state. I don't want to return home to a state that's 50% not Jewish. And that's why the problem of the occupation is so deep. And the fact that I think the other side has figured it out. They figured it out how much we need to end the, occup the occupation. Well, D David, I want to just ask a follow-up on that because, you know, a great rabbi, a sage, Rabbi Emeritus Stephen Carr Rubin. <laughs> the drummer. Once, the drummer once said that what you say matters. And if you say occupation, it means one thing. If you say liberated territories, it means another thing. If you say disputed territories, it means another thing. I think, Evelyn, maybe what I'm hearing was your concern was that, David, your choice of words. And then this gentleman up here is going to have the you next know, question. Uh, Sharon used the term occupation. I'm past the stage of semantics because for me it's not about semantics anymore. It's about the reality on the ground. And the reality on the ground is the two million non-Jews that are in my living room, and I need a get. You know what a get is? I need a get. They won't give me a get. 
Sir, up, uh, thank you to all of those in the farthest reaches. Yeah. Nice. Well, I'm a guest too here. First time in this synagogue. Welcome. I, I Welcome. The West Side. Mm-mm. My name is Dr. We're going to send you an invoice. <laughs> <laughs> Remember those. David, you know what? I, I'm Israeli American. I grew up in Haifa. And uh, I have to commend you because you transferred me from somebody who used to receive this Jewish journal emails every day, twice a day, and just curse you for every, all those, some of those. Uh, uh, Unsubscribe. Articles. Yeah, but you know what? No, he said, I, sorry, he said past tense. Yeah, oh. I did. Then okay. you transferred me to someone who actually takes some of the good news out of your journal. And trust me, I go through several sections and I. You like it? Um, so, so? I can handle I, it. I know, I know what, I, I, what I have to filter. Okay. Um, so the question, sir. So, so I grew up in, in a city in Haifa. I'm a graduate of the Technion. I'm a doctor of medicine. I deal with breast cancer, and I treated more Arab ladies, women with breast cancer than, than Israelis. So, and I'm here, and I've been here for 30 years. And I hear you all about occupation, and I have two simple questions. Number one, what has happened to the American jury in the last 30 years to have become almost 50% to the right, 50% to the left, where is now 76% to the left, barely to the right? That's one question. The second one is that I am an uneducated, deplorable, American, Israeli, Jew conservative. Do you guys, all the Americans, including myself, we live here in Los Angeles, do you guys feel yourselves as occupiers? Like you accuse Israelis. Well, I, th- I think we're going to let, I think, thank you very much. But I think okay. we're going to let David yeah. take that question on behalf of the entire group. Okay. Um, I'll take the first one first. Why did it move? so much to the left in America is because Israel moved to the right. So it used to be, you know, you'd get uh, Rabin, Perez, and you know, you get the left mini- uh, prime ministers, then you get the right, you go left to right, left to right, and then all of a sudden, you know, the right came in, and I call it reality wing. It's sort of the reality in Israel sort of moved to the right. You have to just remember that after the, um, the Camp David, Ehud Barak made this amazing proposal at Camp David. And after that, there was the second intifada. So this is the Israeli mentality. We offered up half of Jerusalem. We made this great offer, 95% of the West Bank, blah, blah, blah. And we got, you know, 150 terror attacks over two years. And the second thing is, we left Gaza, and we got rewarded by 15,000 rockets. Call their bluff. So this, we didn't go through this in America. They went through this in Israel. It's not a coincidence that the liberal movement in Israel, they used to have 100,000 people on a Saturday night in Rabin Square for the peace movement. It shrunk. It didn't shrink because Israelis became mean people. It didn't shrink because Israelis became right-wing hawks. It shrank because the reality of their situation moved to the right. That did not happen in America because we didn't get the bombs from Gaza and we didn't get the second intifada. So there is a lag between the journey of the American Jew with Israel and the journey of the Israeli Jew in Israel. And that's what you've seen. And that's why you've seen this right-wing coalition that's accentuated that difference. As far as the (coughs) occupation, you know, the fact that Israel is responsible ultimately for two million, for the, you know, uh, Palestinians. I've read all the books. I know all that. I know that there was absolutely no idea of a Palestinian state. Between 1948 and 67, they never even brought it up. When the PLO was founded in 64, they never brought up a state. It all started as an anti-Zionist movement. I'm totally aware that the Palestinian movement does not have these nationalistic roots, but I don't really care. All I care about is what's good for Israel. And what's good for Israel is we need a get. We need a get. And I I think it's better for the Palestinians. But I don't want to sit here and pretend whether to use the word occupation or not occupation, 
I don't really care how we call it, you know, because I think you have to look at the interest of Israel. And the interest of Israel is to separate from the Palestinians. They need it. You know, we tried, the marriage thing may work in 50 years. It's not working right now. It's not. You had the, the uh, Barkan Business Park. You guys remember a few weeks ago? This was the example of peaceful coexistence. It was the epitome of co coexistence, and it was the thing where Palestinians and Jews worked together in a business park. And one day, a Palestinian came and just murdered a, a colleague. So it's a difficult situation, and separation is the key. Okay, um, we'll take, uh, how about two more questions? Two hands up, and then, uh, then I've got my final one question lightning round. Okay, good. With, you can give a one word answer. Um, thank you, sir. I was surprised to find out that Israel makes avionics for Russian attack helicopters. And I was wondering if you can elucidate the relationship between Israel and Russia. I didn't know about that thing you just mentioned. It's a mess because there was a vacuum that was created by the last U.S. administration that pulled back and Russia filled the vacuum. Russia is trying to regain its former glory. And one of the ways it can regain its former glory is to show its, its, its power. And it also has a, a strategic interest in terms of getting a, a port in that part of the, uh, of the world and energy sources. It's too late. They're there. And it's an enormous problem. Bibi has met with Putin more than any other leader. He's been there uh, six, seven times, just spoke to him again. This coordination, it's a tinderbox. Um, so I don't know what to tell you. It's a real complicated situation because the interests are commingled between Syria, Iran, um, Russia, and even Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. So you've got this really messy situation. The only good news I can tell you is that there's a certain mutual respect between Putin and, uh, and Bibi. And Putin does not want an all-out war, but they want to stick it to America. And said, ha, look, we took over. And in, in Russia, that means a lot. It gives them a source of power because they look for things. In non-democratic countries, things like prestige are very important. And right now, this nourishes his prestige. So I'll recommend a book that Rabbi Hyman recommended to me, Catch 67, which Fantastic. is not really about the 67 war, Fantastic. but it talks about all the changing, how the Israel left became the right and the Israel right became the left. It's very interesting. Um, this gentleman, I believe, has the last question. Um, mm. Thank you. I really enjoyed all this all of your presentations. I was struck by one thing. I'm Ashkenazi. Uh, I just had my Ancestry.com done 94%, which I figure Nobody's is enough, perfect. probably. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm not sure what an Ashkenazi look is. I would like to know how to do an Ashkenazi look. I tease them all the time. I'm a, I'm a constant teaser of Ashkenazi Sephardic. 99% of all my guests are Ashkenazi at my Shabbat table. Uh, they're, uh, literally, I'm, I'm surrounded by the Ashkenazi world. I'm a member of Yik, the most Ashkenazi synagogue in, uh, in Pico Robertson. Ashkenazi is like you have Sephardic who come from Spain. Ashkenazi is European, Eastern European. I've got to tell you, you know, I never knew the Holocaust existed until I met an Ashkenazi Jew. I was born and raised in Morocco. And it was a totally different type of Judaism. I never lived through the trauma of the Holocaust. So I made Ashkenazi friends and I moved to Montreal. And it took me years to appreciate the deep, deep trauma that the Holocaust has caused, not only with survivors, but to the whole Ashkenazi world. And if there's one thing that is different between Ashkenazim and Sephardic, it's that. We were not raised with the trauma. It's a different type of Judaism. In fact, you know, uh, I think one of the great things about our generation is my ancestors for centuries never met an Ashkenazi Jew. And it's quite possible your ancestors for centuries never met a Sephardic Jew. But we're blessed to be living in this generation of the grand Jewish family reunion. 
you go and pick a Roberts in my neighborhood, there's probably Jews from a hundred different nationalities. And I think it's a gift that we have today where we can exchange these different traditions and we can talk in terms of we're both Jewish and yet we've been reading from the same book for 2,000 years. None of the letters have changed. You, know, you guys were saying the same Kiddush that we were saying in Morocco. But it's a different Judaism that I grew up with in Morocco. It's not the Judaism of the Polish winters. It's a Judaism... It's the Judaism of the Baba Saleh. It's the Judaism of the, of the desert. Judaism of the sun. It's more hopeful, more tolerant. It's a different Judaism. If you want to know how I'm making the Jewish journal different, I'm making it a little more Sephardic. I'm adding poetry, and I'm adding beauty, and I'm adding aesthetics. A Jewish journal for me is like my Shabbat table. And it's got to be beautiful. It's got to be more hopeful. It's got to be more aesthetic. And to wrap up the evening, it's got to provoke thought, not anger. Okay. <laughs> that, that's, that's a beautiful ending. So, one word, answer, oh, I forgot. final. Oh, my God. No, I we were done. You don't need the mic for this. Yeah. You're right. I was born with a mic. Okay. <laughs> the diaspora, Jews, and Israel Jews. Two pillars or an arch? pillars hoping to be an arch. <laughs> Amen. So my final word is, first of all, thank you to everyone. A lot of people are looking at the concept of a new covenant. And at Israel Matters, we're trying to model the new covenant ourselves here with respect to discussions on Israel. So you know what? Throwing out a few things. Americans and Israelis, neither one has a monopoly on virtue. Let's not be afraid of having the tough conversations, but let's try and prefer discussion and solutions and don't try and win the arguments. No synagogue can claim to be a single shul for all the people, for all the Jewish people. And honestly, what I picked up most out of my most recent trip to Israel is, you know what, we're all on our own individual Jewish journey. And if we can all agree that the state of Israel is the homeland for the Jewish people and something that we can all love and connect and that we can struggle over and we can discuss and we can look at nuance and elevate the conversation, then to me, for all of us, that's going to be a victory and a very good thing. Amen. So with that, we want to wish all of you a very happy Thanksgiving. Um, may your Thanksgiving table be blessed with elevated and nuanced conversation. Um, and may your turkeys come out just right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.